to the defensive end episode of Building the Board. It's not a position group the Cowboys have a ton of depth in now, but there are plenty of draft prospects that can make a difference here in Dallas. I'm Danny Sarek, and I'm going to bring in Dave Hellman up to the big board with me. Dave? This is a position that the Cowboys already know their starters. They've got Demarcus Lawrence and they've got Randy Gregory. They let Alton Smith walk in free agency, who had the second most sacks on the team last year. Where does the defensive end rank in terms of need for the Cowboys this draft? Uh, the fun thing about this defense is can't you just say everything's a need? Like you can just go down the list. Of course defensive end's a need, and it really has been for quite some time. They did, you know, they managed to strike a little bit of gold with Alden Smith. It doesn't appear as though he's coming back. And really – not to bring up painful wounds from the past, but when you miss on a first-round defensive end like they did with Taco Charlton, you've got ground to make up, and that's where they find themselves. Demarcus Lawrence and Randy Gregory is a pretty nice duo, but yeah, it would be awesome to bolster this depth and maybe find another young pass rusher. If they can find a young pass rusher on the first day, who would you like for those options? That's the, it's, it's ironic, it really is, because everybody agrees defense is this team's primary need. The way the board falls, it doesn't really work out that well. Uh, and I, it sucks to say, but you know, if the Cowboys were picking top 10 in any other year, there would be a million pass rushers for us to talk about. And there are, you know, Quiddy Pay out of Michigan, super athletic guy, super bendy. His three cone time was insane. Uh, the, the Miami duo, like your, your Gregory Rousseau could slip into the first round. Aziz Ojolari out of Georgia is another guy that could see his stock really climb purely based on athleticism. Like if you can get around the corner and rush the passer, you're gonna get drafted high. But there isn't that surefire thing. There isn't a Chase Young in this class. There isn't a Joey or Nick Bosa in this class, which is unfortunate because if there was, I think he would be the runaway favorite to be the Cowboys pick at 10. As it stands right now, I would be at least slightly surprised to see him go that way. Okay, so if, if you would be surprised with the top 10 pick, you wouldn't be as surprised maybe days two or three. Who sure. are some guys that you would be okay with them taking in those rounds? Which, that's a, it's a fun spot for them to be because there are talented players in this class and they pick early. You think it's been a while, but they found Demarcus Lawrence at 34 overall. They traded up to get him. Maybe you don't have to trade to find a guy like a Carlos Basham out of Wake Forest. Wouldn't surprise me to see him climb into the first round. Jalen Phillips and Gregory Rousseau, we talked about the Miami duo. It'll be interesting to see where they go. Like, I could see either of them being a top 15 pick. I could see him being there for you at 44. Uh, another guy that I like a lot, I'm sure a lot of people here in Texas do, Joseph Asai. Again, sky high potential just based on his athleticism. The vast majority of these guys are projects, if you will, and that's a little bit scary. But again, if you can rush the passer, you get drafted high. The Cowboys signed defensive end Terrell Basham in free agency, and Kyle Yeomans is actually going to break down some footage of his cousin, Carlos, out of Wake Forest. Kyle? Yeah, a little bit of a family connection that could happen with the star on the side of the helmet between Terrell Basham and Carlos Boogie Basham. I don't know if his cousin had any kind of influence on the nickname, but it's one of my favorites in the draft class. Six foot three, 281 pounds, and as you take a look at his 2020 stat line, five sacks, 28 tackles. Sure, that's pretty impressive in its own right. However, he had a streak of 23 games straight with a tackle for loss, the longest in NCAA football history. He has a knack for getting in the backfield, and that's why you draft Boogie Basham. Let's take a look at how he does so. The first two plays are sacks. This one coming up against Duke, Bull Rush. His length is phenomenal, and you can see it here. Get off me. Just pushes that right tackle out of the line of scrimmage and is able to make the play back behind the quarterback against the Blue Devils. He does it again here, but it's a swim move instead. He not only has the length, he not only has the power, but he has a little finesse to his game as well. With the length that he does have, he gets back through the line of scrimmage against not only the Rice Owls, but he does force the fumble there as well on the sack. And then one of my favorite ways that he does make an impact in a football game is in the run game. This one's against Clemson. Of course, you have Etienne, Trevor Lawrence, two of the first round prospects, but watch the entire left side of this Clemson offense just trying to wall bash him off, and they do so successfully, at least at the start, but then he turns around and he's still able to make a play on one of the better running backs in the NFL draft. So potentially, if you're looking at Wake Forest and you're looking at Carlos Basham, he's a guy that's gonna bring that energy, he's gonna bring that power, 
Can he do it on a consistent basis? That's one of the biggest questions with his game because he does take play off, plays off from time to time, and I think that's the only way that, Dave, you said he might sneak into the first round. I think it's the only way he's not a first-round prospect. And we'll take another look here at his run defense here as he does actually have a tackle for loss here uh, on the – or excuse me, at home here for Wake Forest. But I think the way that he just is able to shake off of an up, up back, he's a bigger, physical, talented player, somebody that I think in day two, if the Cowboys were to see him fall to 44, he would be very much so in the conversation. The Cowboys might not have a ton of depth at the position, but they do have youth in Dorrance Armstrong, Rondell Carter, and Bradley and I. Kyle, how much would you prefer to see those younger players get more reps this year under new defensive coordinator Dan Quinn rather than the Cowboys use an early pick on a defensive end? I love this question because, of course, I want Bradley to not, uh, and I to play, and I've said that really throughout the year, but I would also love to have a little bit more depth. And we, Dave did a phenomenal job of going through that a moment ago of talking about just how little depth there really is at the, the edge spot. Sure, you do have the top end talent of Demarcus Lawrence and Randy Gregory. You have some of that youth, but in 2020, you got a chance to see a ton of that youth and it didn't, didn't necessarily result in any production, didn't necessarily result uh, in, in any positivity. I think if you go out and you get a premium player at the edge spot, something you haven't done over the last couple of drafts, really since Taco Charlton, I think it could really help out this defensive end rotation and maybe even provide a little bit of help for Gregory and Lawrence. I'm about to say something that might come across as mean. I, I, I don't mean it to because I, I love Bradley and I'm still excited that he's part of this team. Same goes for Rondell Carter. I'm excited to see what those guys can do in year two. But the thing is, pass rushers, you don't find dynamite pass rushers on day three of the draft very often. Yes, there's a success story for every position, but for lack of a better word, badass edge rushers <laughs> are drafted in the top 50. That is more often than not where they're found. If they're really good, top 10. And that's what makes this draft so weird is that there isn't that guy. But that said, if you really want to bolster this position and really feel good about it, it's probably got to be a day one or day two pick. And again, that's that's not a knock on Bradley and I or anybody else, but the statistics just prove that. That is where you find the guys that are capable of getting eight, nine, ten, or maybe much more sacks. They are drafted high because what they do is so hard. So if you really want to address it, I think it needs to be done early. Otherwise, I'm perfectly fine rolling forward with the guys that are already here. You say those big time players are found in the top 50 picks. Cowboys have 10 and 44 right now. So Dave, if you're following that same guideline, who would you like to see the Cowboys draft? I'm not just saying this because of how we set up this segment, but Carlos Basham just makes a lot of sense. He's probably the closest thing to a ready-made player of this group. Again, we're talking about a lot of guys where it's more potential than production. Carlos Basham had the production, and better yet, there's a decent chance he's in your range in the second round, or maybe you could do a minor trade up to get him. I like the thought of that a lot more than taking a chance on somebody at number 10 overall. And I think if you look at some of the other prospects that are right in that sweet spot at 44, and even if you wanted to see if one would fall to 75, I think Basham is that ready fit player. I mean, he's going to be a three down, four, three end. He's going to come in and not have to be and not have the pressure to be amazing. He can come in and play behind Randy Gregory and still provide a lot of pressure on the quarterback, put up some, some good numbers. And we've said it time and time again on this show, on the draft show, throughout draft coverage, if you get to the quarterback in college, if you get in the backfield in college, you're going to have a chance to do it in the pros. And that's exactly what Boogie Basham did. And I think he could do that for the Cowboys as well. Some really wonderful insight from the two of you on the defensive end position leading up to the draft. That'll do it for this episode on Building the Board. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.